he refused to go to the hospital. And he said, if I do not see my son, I go away. Already my dad already passed. And it just to tell you, no matter how we continue to hold important conversations around family members, it could be impactful. Possibly, maybe negatively depending, but I also feel so bad for my grandfather that nobody actually told him that he saw that past. Um, I want to try to talk a little bit about understanding mental health disparities in the black community. And um, this speaks to a lot, of, a lot of the ways that we have been seen in our community and the way we see ourselves. Um, as a believer of positive psychology, particularly for all like a community given that surrounding around like liberation, freedom, justice, you know, um, advocacy and all of that. Um, I want to give you these four positive lens of how I want you to uh, see yourself when you walk out of this room. Resilience, we use that word almost every day. You're like, oh no, I'm resilient. I'm resilient. But I feel like it's mortal. When you fall, do you sit on the floor? Or do you continue to move? That's up to that's up to you. You know, when you fall, I might decide to say no. I gotta wait for the big of uh, Morris County to come and pick me up because I'm not standing <laughs> up. Or you know what? I'm just gonna wait for the state to pay me because I'm not gonna move up. And guess what? What if the state don't come? Are we really gonna sit on the floor? Or are we gonna keep it moving? Um, so the woman has a yes, it's something that's been with us for a very long time and we, even from like when we see our mothers struggle, our parents struggle, our grandfathers, our family members struggle through different kind of health issues. And we even see people who have been diagnosed with cancer surviving. And you could tell that, yes, they are resilient. They're able to say, listen, I'm not going to be defined by my cancer. I'm not going to be defined by one condition. I'm going to live through this. Okay? You know, when we look at optimism, as members of black community, we do have even when we're told that we're not going to make it, we're not going to advance in our career, we'd be like, no, I'm going to make it, I don't care what you say, I got us. You know, when we say those things, it might look like affirmations to us, but we're also telling ourselves, I don't care what you think about, you can keep it in the closet. I care about what I think about myself, and that's where the optimism comes in. This is how we should be seeing ourselves. You know, we don't need anybody to tell us that we don't look beautiful. No, I don't need that compliment. That's your opinion. You can keep it. But you know what? When someone, I don't need anybody to tell me how beautiful I am. I tell myself that every day, and that's a fact. But what someone else thinks about me, that's an opinion. I would care about any opinion. I don't. Uh, but we we'll also look at hope. Um, all the stories that we've had over time about how our ancestors have been treated, we still see light at the end of the tunnel. We know that we are going to be liberated, no matter how we continuously face all these challenges and also we're going to flourish amongst all of all of this. Um, as members of the black community, there are negative views that I've seen like in different literature about us being very aggressive, very lazy, and all of these things don't matter. It doesn't matter to a point where we hear all these negative things and we let it affect us. But that's how people see us. But are we really bad? No. We are not <coughs> going to be worried about these labels because they do not define who we really are. So, I'm Breaker, and this is where I said it's gonna be interactive. I'm gonna start with a lesson. Um, what is your thing to remind you of? Um, so, my trick is, as a uh, Caribbean descendant, um, Juneteenth is still fairly new to me. Um, so, as I learn each year more and more about the, the meaning behind the, the true origin of the story of Juneteenth, for me, there was a disconnect in some ways. My family's Caribbean, so I couldn't quite associate with the American or the Black American story of what coming up and, and freedom and, and all that looks like. But I think I have to remember that if it was for the Black, the black Americans or the African Americans here in the U.S., my parents would not have had an opportunity to be immigrants into the U.S. and afford me the opportunity that was afforded. So at the end of the day, it is still my history yeah. because it made mm -hmm. an impact on how I am able to be here today and the opportunity. Thank you so much. What makes your heart happy? What makes my heart happy? I think paying it forward. Being mm -hmm. able to know that I have the capability, as well as I'm well willing, I have the capability to open the door or pull up a seat or invite someone else mm -hmm. along on the journey and hopefully have it super seat where I got to. That's beautiful. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ben, can you tell me what you can think in my job? Juneteenth is 
It's the beginning of the Those two words, those two statements might mean like, 
They might be very simple, but like when I hear someone tell me, I got you, I don't, they don't necessarily have to give me money, but just saying like, I got you, I feel like it's a very powerful affirmation, like wait, you got me, like really? Like you won't be, like you won't listen to what I gotta say without telling me that I'm stupid or foolish. So I, I feel like we've been able to say all of that in all the things that we share. Um, I know we don't have a piece of paper, but like um, I have I have paper. Oh, yeah. But I only have so many oh, pens. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you just write down like three people that you can identify as a support system? Three people that you can identify. Oh, Like you couldn't fly all over and say I'm going 
in today's no. You could even some, sometimes you, you can't even leave your house because you're scared of I don't want to get sick. And that's so evident that even with technological advancement, we did not get that satisfaction that we wanted from passing off the elections. Even though I'm thinking about like families who died, families who couldn't see their family members that were passing or that were sick in the hospital. Family members who went to the hospital were just traveling like, I want to see my, I want to see my loved one. Someone wanted to give birth, right? And they couldn't see their baby. It was so, imagine having to think about like, I wasn't there to witness all that I needed to witness just because we were on the lockdown. So it just tells us like, Personal connections just go beyond um, just phone. Like we could, we could do all that on the phone, but sometimes we have to talk in person. We have to connect more than how we was supposed to be connected. And um, I'm just gonna breeze through this. So my question to you all in this room, based on all the things that we've talked about, about family support and that support system, like the communities where we're living, our workplace, our churches, do you think that it is okay to disclose your mental health condition with the presence that you've identified in this room as your support system. I'm not saying just anybody now. With the persons that you identify in this room as your support system. Yeah. So before I answer that question, I want to share something for a second. Yes. Yes. <laughs>
instead of go back in the happy tree instead of go back. So I, I certainly would disclose whatever is in my mind on that topic. Uh, thank you so much. Alexis, thank you, Hannah. Yes. I just kind of wanted to give a, 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 a different side to it because she, Anna came with her story and said that she she knew that this was the people that she could lean on. I think the piece that Anna was not recognizing now that I'm going to own forward because it's something I had to learn was if you're not comfortable with yourself, you will not be willing to share. So I have my list of three people that have been through Oregon and beyond with me and brought me all the way back and have carried me through some things and we have gone through the trenches. And I'm like, when I realized, when I, did, I think COVID again, the, the period of life that just made you kind of sick and kind of do some reassessment, like who am I? What do I really want in life? Did I want my job in the first place? Right, like all those things that you're going through, I realized that there were things that I didn't share that I would hear my friends sharing. But on the inside, I was still kind of tight. I was still kind of holding on to it. And I was like, because I didn't settle with it. I didn't come out of peace. And with, even with the ugliness of it, whatever it was, I just had not gotten comfortable with the ugliness of that. So until I got to the place where I was like, I'm about to say this out loud. And you could judge me, but because you're in my time for you, better not. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, and then they're looking at me like, and then the beauty of it was when I finally did this close, they were like, Princess, I was going to do that like six weeks ago. What are you talking about? And I was like, oh, so you're not alone. Like, so many things you think were the only one facing it. And like, when you realize, your people are your people for a reason. You yeah. either been through it, going through it, or about to go through it. Yeah. So you're either going to get help, you're going to go through it and struggle together, or you're about to prepare to teach the next one coming out. Yeah. Right? So That's true. I'm grateful for the, that I found, or I was able to find the peace in my in my ugliness, is what I say, the yes. peace in the blemishes that are not so, that don't look so pretty. Um, because we all have them. We all have them. Mm -hmm. That's something we, I think, overall as a people, and I think especially after our people have to figure out how to be happy. Yes, yes, that's so true. Thank you so much, Alexis, for sharing. Um, and I was going to ask you, do you think there are any benefits to disclosing mental health with your support system? Can you share with us? Yeah, you know, I, as someone who has, you know, I'll have like my people, you know, my couple of people, maybe even just two people, not even three, <laughs> who, who I'm willing to share anything with. But even, even so, I think, you know, a lot of things, it's like, oh, that's too uncomfortable to share, or you're not, you, you don't trust enough because of, you know, whatever reason they did something to you, or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the thing is. Yes. And, but I think it's important because you need that accountability yes. in order to yes. survive and take care yes. of yourself. Yes. But it's it's really hard to do that, you know, when, when you're like, She is 
hold on. So she didn't want to stab me, to interrupt me by saying something. So she started tapping me. Then I turned my laptop off and said, I'm going to talk to you. Can you give me like 30 minutes? And she said, okay. But that 30 minutes, she was already sleeping. By the time I remember to check on her, then she wrote something. She wrote like a note and put it under my pillow because she knew that well. Even if it's 3 a.m., I have to go to bed to sleep. So she put it under the pillow, then I lifted the pillow. I saw the notes. She drew her thing, her tongue. She drew her tongue. She covered it, told me she was having pain. She put it there like how long? It had been going on for like four days. I looked at it and went to her room. She was already sleeping, had to call her. So the following morning, she went to school because I had to get up very early. She was dropped off on my doctor, so I didn't have a chance to say anything. So my brother came back and was like, I'm so sorry, I hugged her, what happened? And she was like, she didn't want to disturb me, but she told me that. So we need to pay attention, we need to listen to our children. That was the, I mean, just an aside, uh, to use myself as, a, um, as an example. So open communication, we need to have dialogue, open communication with her. Because sometimes these children may be going through a lot of things. When I came in, you mentioned bullying. I mean, that book is, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have young ones anymore, but I was thinking that I still have uh, nephews, I have nieces. Those books, I think every parent should have a copy of the books. I'm not sure whether you've been to uh, elementary schools. Yes, I think that should be your next talk uh, to, uh, to, like, um, yeah, the dispensing books, give it to them. So active listening is a communication skill that involves going beyond simply hearing the words. Now, I'm going to go back to my job as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, as a provider. Okay, hearing the words that another person is saying, it's about actively processing and seeking to understand the meaning and the intent behind them. So patient comes in, you want to listen, you want to be here at the time not thinking about your own baggage or thing that has happened to you. So you want to be at that presence, at that moment, in order to get some verbal cues and non-verbal cues about your patients. It requires being a mindful and focused participant in the communication process. You want to be engaged, okay? You want to listen to them. Same thing, you should be able to apply it to our uh, children I don't know, I see that you're expecting one. <coughs> Is that your first? Second. Second, great. Congratulations. How many hours? Uh, how many hours? Almost five. Almost five, okay. All right, thank you. So, from one fixed position to be fully present with another, you want to empathize with that patient. There have been some, so many times when you to come in, and you know what? With the affect, like what you see on their face. Patient may be hungry coming in because I mean, they have a lot of frustration. That's why they are coming into us, right? As a provider. But most of the time, this is my patient who walk out smiling. So I always ask them, when you came in, your affect is different from the time that they're walking out now. And what are you trying to think back or am I anxious? I'm thinking you need to uh, judge me. I think that's a lot. Sometimes our, page, our children might feel the same way. Not telling us, not telling us like the things they were supposed to tell us as parents because they may be thinking that we need to judge them. So active communication helps people to feel more understood and strengthen the relationship as it signals willingness to sit with others' perspective and empathize, right, with them. Both with patients, and our children at home. In communication, active listening is important because it keeps you engaged with your conversation partner. Partner can either be your patient, it can also be your children at home in a positive way. It makes the other person feel calm and valued. Not just talking. You want to reflect on what they just said and ask them, right? That's okay, you are with them. Empathize. <coughs> is different from sympathizing with them. And the same thing, you should also do it with our children at home, 
especially with the teenagers. Anyone with teenagers currently? I'm making one. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are several active listening techniques that I know most of us are I mean, might be using, you may not know, but that we use daily. The fully present, I already mentioned that. We pay attention to rather what they're saying and what they're not saying. Like, you're talking to me the way that if I say them, as a provider, both bring this way. That's kind of expensive, right? Okay. So, non verbal And non verbal of the patient as well. The patient is sitting down, crossing the legs, and you're like, okay, shaking the legs, and that person is anxious. So you want to let them know that, okay, I know you are anxious, but you are in a safe environment. You are free, simply, you are free to, uh, let me tell me wherever it's going on with you. I'm here to help you. And for you to make a post, like to come in, I mean, you want to come in, come in there, or come in there. All right. So, not just mental approach, I already mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Because they like this, you can be a mixture of mental So, you want to keep good eye contact. That's very important. But at the same time, you want some culture. I'm not talking about people that are young that are growing up now. I'll use myself as an example with Nigeria. When I was growing up in Nigeria, if you're talking to your teachers or elder people, you know, looking into their eyes directly. Because that is the past, I mean, that you are old. That's a sign of goodness. But in, in America, <coughs> that might be a sign of weakness. Yeah. Or maybe you're trying to hide something. So you want to pay attention to the culture of that person that you are saying, but make it a good eye contact. Even here, good eye contact is very important, but at the same time, maybe 60% of the time, not looking straight into the body, right? You have to like, okay, shift the contact, like do something else, so the person will feel comfortable. Asking open-ended questions is different from asking like yes or no questions. It's very important, even with our children at home, with our family members, right? And with the patients, open ended questions. So, I'll give you an example. When a patient comes to me and I'm asking about if there's any traumatic events, like about the childhood, how was your childhood? Some people might say, Oh, my childhood was okay, it was great, it was not good. But you want to ask more questions. Can you tell me about your childhood? That's an open ended question. Tell me more about your childhood. Even though you can say I was a child, you want to ask like more questions, that's open-ended questions. Like going to your children and asking them, oh, high school today, oh, great, fine. And that's it, you walk away, but there will be something else. What well, happened? Uh, yeah, so what happened? Oh, so with the uh, program that you, I mean, you were finding for the summer, did you discuss it with your teacher, what is going to be you know? So you want to ask more questions, so that's very important. So that's one of the uh, examples uh, that I would give. What about being patient? Sometimes the patient comes to you, before the patient finish talking, you're already jumping. Oh, okay, so you want to be patient, you want to be, I mean, listen actually, same thing with our children. Be patient, let them just pause, whatever that is going on. But then it's very important. We try to listen to understand, not to respond. 